Hello, everyone. Welcome to our third People's Garden webinar. I'm John Rice, and I work in USDA's Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovative Production. This office is a government resource that supports producers through grants, agreements, a federal advisory committee, and of course, the, People Gar the People's Garden Initiative. We encourage gardens everywhere to register their garden for free. Visit usda.gov forward slash people's garden to get connected with other gardens from across the country and learn about helpful resources and information such as future webinars. We're really excited to share our webinar today where we will celebrate our garden's most necessary guests, the pollinators. Sort of sounds like an action movie, doesn't it? Well, in a sense, maybe it is. Only the superheroes in this feature are honeybees, butterflies, birds, bats, beetles, and many other pollinators, because without them, agriculture and much of Earth's ecosystems would not survive. Of the nearly 1,400 crop plants grown around the world, almost 80% require pollination. Visits from our pollinators also result in tastier fruits and vegetables and higher crop yields. Nobody knows this better than our speakers we have lined up for you today. They will be providing their expertise on pollination, the habitat and recent decline of our pollinators, recent plants that attract beneficial insects, and how to incorporate pollinator-friendly plants into urban gardens. But before I introduce them, I wanna mention a few housekeeping items. Please place any questions or comments in the Q&A box by clicking the icon at the bottom of your screen. The recorded webinar will be posted to usda.gov forward slash people's garden soon after the webinar. For those interested in receiving the latest news from our office, please sign up for email updates by visiting farmer.gov forward slash urban. You will receive information about upcoming webinars, our newsletter, and other information to stay engaged. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. Cass Urban Mead is an NRCS partner biologist and the Mid-Atlantic Pollinator Conservation Specialist for the Xerce Society, where she provides technical assistance in the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast regions. She also works with staff and research partners to develop technical guidelines and provides training on pollinator conservation practices. We also have Stephanie Steele with us today. She's based in Detroit, Michigan. She's also an NRC, NRCS partner biologist and works as the Upper Midwest Pollinator Conservation Specialist for the Xerce Society, providing technical assistance for conservation plannings to historically underserved urban and small scale producers. Her work supports projects, including the Xerces Habitat Kit Program, the People's Garden Initiative, and NRCS conservation programs through the USDA Farm Bill. Welcome to both of you and thank you for joining us today. All right, and we will start their presentation here. There we go, perfect. All right. Yeah, thank you so much, John. And thank you also to our ASL interpreters here today. Um, and welcome to our Pollinator Week webinar on beneficial insects in the city, supporting pollinators and other good bugs in urban settings. And so as John mentioned, my name is Stephanie and Cass and I are really excited to be here with you all today. And as we go through the presentation and taking turns speaking, we'll do our best to answer your questions in the Q&A box in real time. Next slide, please. And just a little bit about Xerces Society for those of you that might be new to us. We are a member supported invertebrate conservation nonprofit organization that protects wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. So we're protecting the life that sustains us like insects, which are like, I like to say, the little things that run the world. And we also work with folks like you all and use applied science to guide our habitat restoration, conservation efforts, policy and education materials. Next slide, please. 
And as I said, we are member supported. So donors, perhaps like yourself, truly do make our work possible. So we wanna thank you right off the bat. Next slide. And here's a map of our staff members at Xerces. Our main office is located over in Portland, Oregon. But Xerces has program field staff and other supportive staff all across the country working to support invertebrate conservation. I'm based in Michigan, um, up in Detroit, and Cass is in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, and we're both on the pollinator team. So many of us in this position uh, also work as USDA NRCS partner biologists. And with this, we work to support NRCS staff and their programs through technical assistance, education, and sharing expertise on pollinators and their habitats. Next slide. Several of Xerces team members are also working with many of the flagship People's Garden Initiative projects across the 17 urban center hubs uh, and beyond on pollinator and beneficial insect habitat and education. Uh, here's a couple examples from People's Garden uh, farms that I worked with uh, recently in Grand Rapids and New Orleans. Uh, if the People's Garden Initiative is new to you, you can see from this map this map in the center, just how widespread the initiative is. They are spanning across the country to help connect and provide resources to community-oriented urban farms and gardens. And with that, I am now going to pass things off to Cass to help us better understand the importance of pollinators and beneficial insects. Wonderful, thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, all right, can you see me all right here? Wonderful. Yes, yes, you look great. Cool, thank you so much. So it is so great to be here and thanks Stephanie for setting us up there. Um, so as I get ready to introduce our pollinators, we wanted to start by thinking about how pollinator habitat fits into larger urban ecosystems with development pressure, often challenging land access, high costs of soil and material, and serious inequities in food access, prioritizing beneficial insect habitat in precious urban spaces can sometimes seem counterintuitive when there's food to be grown. Um, however, to my mind, pollinator habitat is a crucial part of food access and food sovereignty in urban areas. When we plant habitat, as you'll see in the second panel here, we su support both pollinators and beneficial insects. What this means is when we plant food crops, there are then free living, healthy, good bugs ready to help turn these plants from flowers into nutrient dense and beloved seeds, fruits, nuts and vegetables, which are so important in both our diets and multiple cuisines. For example, at this People's Garden site picture to the left in that first picture under the word habitat, Anna Herman and her students are turning part of their North Philadelphia school's parking lot into a nutrient dense vegetable and perennial foods garden, um, and then are dedicating nearly a thousand square feet also to adjacent pollinator habitat in order to ensure that the vegetables they plant bear fruit. Other gardens nearby in the neighborhood are also planting pollinator habitat in hopes that across the neighborhood they'll be able to support a vibrant pollinator network. As we'll discuss, many pollinator plants also provide multiple other ecosystem services such as temperature moderation, soil health and stabilization, stormwater infrastructure benefits, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, in addition to beauty, a sense of place, educational opportunities, and community health. So with that in mind, what is pollination? Who are our pollinators? Next slide. Great. So pollination um, is an incredibly important ecosystem function, more than 85% of our flowering plants require an animal, often usually an insect, and especially bees are super good at it, to move pollen from one plant to another. This is because plants don't have legs, they can't get up and walk around and get to each other to reproduce. They need another organism to pick up the pollen and move it to another organism in order to get that genetic diversity and turn that flower into food or seed. Next slide. And um, here's some just kind of shocking photos from a Whole Foods campaign. On the left here, we see, you know, an overflowing kind of produce section of your grocery store full of lots of different fruits and vegetables, which provide so many of the micronutrients um, and other diet elements that are so crucial for health. 
And then on the right, they photoshopped out all of the crops that were pollinator dependent, just showing really how much less vibrant, interesting, and complex our diets would be without the help of pollinator dependent, um, without pollinator dependent crops. Um, and some of these can be quite subtle because they may be needed for seed production, even if not directly for fruit set or, or vegetable set. Next slide. Um, and then who are the pollinators? So we're about to introduce who some of these players are, but the most important thing right off the bat to understand is that although our minds usually go to honeybees right away, they're actually um, an agricultural bee. They're domesticated, we keep them in hives, and they have, um, they have an agricultural role that is managed and they're the European honeybee, so they're actually not native to this continent. Instead, we have over 5,000 species of native bees on this continent who evolved to be incredibly complex and varied in order to match all the different floral shapes and types of, um, of plants that are out there. And this has direct ramifications to pollination services in crop systems because of these bees' different body types, their different places on their bodies that they have hair, their different strategies for interacting with flowers. They can actually increase fruit set regardless of the number of honeybees available um, through management. So for example, having native bees in this particular research study tripled the production of sun gold cherry tomatoes. Um, and you can see this native bumblebee on the right here holding on to that really uniquely shaped tomato flower. If you have tomatoes, you've probably seen this. The pollen is hidden up inside. And bumblebees are one of the only species that know how to vibrate their thorax just right in order to release that pollen. Honeybees actually don't know how to do this. So we're going to talk more and more about these diverse wild native bees who we're trying to support. Next slide. Um, but I would be remiss not to mention that we are concerned about them. Um, we have uh, you may have heard of the plight of native pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, some pollinators are doing okay, but there are huge proportions of species that are really struggling. Um, at least 28% of bumblebees are threatened. You may have heard of the endangered species, the rusty patched bumblebee, and over 17% of all North American butterflies are at risk. This includes not just habitat specialists who may rely on incredibly unique and rare habitats, but even some who used to be really common and widespread, which is concerning. It's all concerning. <laughs> um, next. Great. Um, and one of the really important features of this is habitat loss. So underpinning stressors from pesticides and other toxins, um, increasing disease pressure, um, climate change causing unpredictable weather and maybe mismatch in when bees and their host plants are, are out in the world. Um, but underpinning all of this is diverse habitat. And so the more we can do um, to have diverse, nutritionally rich habitat available for our pollinators, the more resilient they are in the face of these other stressors. Next. And luckily they're just incredibly inspiring. So here's um, a picture of just four different bees kind of illustrating the enormous diversity in color, in shape, in size, in flower host plant um, that all these different wild bees use. They come in all shapes and sizes, they're active at different times of year and use different flowers. We have over 4,000 um, in the United States, over 5,000 on the continent. Next. And this is kind of a, a detailed life cycle diagram, but it's here to show you um, that actually over 70% of our wild bees are solitary. And so even though our first kind of most common popular conception, again, as I mentioned, is the domesticated European honeybee, um, the vast majority of our free living bees are actually solitary, meaning there's only a single female in charge of a nest. And many of them will only fly for a couple weeks out of the year. So the example life cycle that you're seeing here is for a spring flying solitary bee who nests in the soil. She'll be incredibly gentle because she has no hive to defend, just her sweet little cells underground that she's provisioning with pollen. And we have different bees that fly at all different times of year, which we'll come back to later when Stephanie tells you about how to select plants that provide a succession of blooms from early spring through late fall. The exception to this is bees like bumblebees, who of course are active all year long, creating a complex and vibrant pollinator community. Next. 
All right, so now we're gonna do a profile of just a couple cool bees. I think we'll do four. Um, so here's bumblebees. We'd already talked about their incredible ability um, to buzz pollinate, um, which is kind of, they turn off their wings for a second and use their flight muscles in order to vibrate flowers that require this um, buzzing in order to release the pollen and allow for pollination to happen. Um, and also bumblebees are a great opportunity to think about what the definition of a bee is. I like to say that bees are fuzzy vegetarian wasps. <laughs> wasps are cousins of bees who still pr primarily provision their offspring, their next generation with other insects um, or spiders, whereas bees many, many millions of years ago figured out that there's tons of protein in pollen um, and lots of good nutrients and sugars in nectar. And so they're vegetarian in the sense that they are feeding their babies and their adult selves on the plant parts of pollen and nectar. Next. All right, um, this bee is a little bit less obviously fuzzy, but all bees are fuzzy and vegetarian. And here's a super cool shiny green sweat bee. I love these bees. Um, I've seen them nesting in um, wooden benches in downtown Philadelphia, and I've seen them um, in the middle of the woods, uh, deep, deep in upstate New York. They're just all over the place. They're all over the whole country, super shiny and iridescent. Um, and these guys are really good. Um, they're a little bit smaller bodied. They're good pollinators of things in the carrot family. They, they do have really widespread visitation. You'll probably see them in your garden once you learn to recognize them for, for those little bee jewels that they are. Next. Awesome. We call these guys the longhorned bees. Um, they're in the genus Melisodes, and they'll be coming out pretty soon in a lot of parts of the U.S. Um, they don't actually have horns. That's a common name for their super long antenna that are almost as long as their whole bodies. And they often have this kind of pretty bluish eyes. Here you can really see the fuzziness of their bodies, right? Um, and often um, you'll find the males of these bees who aren't allowed back in the nest at night sleeping in cozy little piles in sunflowers, um, which are incredibly important um, food for pollinators. So um, that's super cute. And if you have any sunflowers, go out early in the morning and start keeping an eye out because you may see these really cool midsummer solitary bees. Next. All right, in the last family we're going to highlight, remember there's over 5,000 species, but they kind of break down in some groups. And here's another one of my favorite groups. This is the family Megachilidae. Um, one of the most charismatic members of this group are the leaf cutter bees, pictured here. And what's unique about this whole family is that instead of carrying their pollen on their legs, as you might most commonly think of for, you know, the, the European honeybee or the bumblebee, they carry their pollen on their underbelly. So if you look at the back half of that bee, the abdomen on the bottom half, you can see that bright orange pollen. Um, and that's, that's characteristic of this whole group. So you can probably start to recognize that they are often found visiting herbs um, in people's gardens. And then um, in people's gardens and in people's gardens. <laughs> Um, and so this is a leaf cutter bee. Um, you can see that she's using her jaws to cut a piece of petal. They often also will cut out stamps of soft leaves like redbud, and they actually take those back to their solitary nests in tunnels to line um, the, the cells where they raise their baby bees. Um, so they have these just incredibly complicated, beautiful life cycles. All right, so I think those are our bee profiles for now. Next slide. So coming back to kind of our logic, right, those are some of the pollinators whose hugely diverse plant preferences and life cycles help to support a diversity of crops. And then we've now underlined beneficial insects. So who are these other beneficial insects be besides the pollinators? We'll introduce that a little bit now. Next slide. Um, so this is part of a larger set of thoughts about what we like to call conservation biocontrol. Um, and that sounds kind of scary and intense. If you're thinking about pest control in your garden and you're trying not to use um, pesticides, or if you're thinking about alternatives to include in your program, often one of the first things people think of is maybe buying or, or animals in or thinking of um, purchasing ladybugs and releasing them in your garden. And that's what we call augmentative biocontrol. You're adding in another species that you're taking from the outside. When we talk about conservation biocontrol, we are trying to create the conditions in the habitat of the garden such that we have these good bugs, right? These helper bugs, which I'll introduce in a second, who are ready to be your allies when a pest comes into your garden. So this is another really serious reason why planting habitat is worth some precious space in your garden, because you're creating a backup team of awesome bugs ready to help with pest management. Next. 
Sweet. So here's just some pictures of these good guys. Um, on the top, we have the beautiful lace wing who has voracious um, larvae right below it in that bottom left picture. Similarly, ladybugs, um, their larvae who in the picture right below it looks a little bit like a spiky alligator. That's a voracious aphid predator. We've got beetles. Um, we have these hoverflies who as adults are bee mimics that are actually very good pollinators, but their larvae are also really voracious predators of pest insects. We have big wasps who may seem scary at first, but if you notice what they're doing, a lot of times they're actually helping to eat the pest caterpillars in your garden, um, keeping that web of life moving. And then this bottom right picture is actually um, parasitized mummies of aphids who are the hosts to little baby wasps that are developing inside of them. So if you're having aphids, look out for these little mummies and see if maybe you know that you have a population of those tiny little parasitoid wasps who are already helping keep them under control. And so we want, what we want to do is plant habitat that supports pollinators and also there's great big overlap in these plants, also bring in these good guy beneficial bugs. Next. So just to recap, um, here's a picture of a lacewing larvae eating an aphid on the left there. Um, we have in our beneficial insect groups of good bugs, we've got the predators, uh, we've got the parasitoids who lay their eggs inside. Maybe you've seen this in tomato hornworm with those big white um, wasp cocoons coming out of their backs. Um, also other arthropods who are not insects, but spiders, um, harvestmen, centipedes, um, some mites and some uh, soil nematodes can also provide a lot of great pest control. And then, like I mentioned, the hoverfly, that bee mimicking fly is one of the many groups who provide simultaneous or at different life stages, some pollination services, and then other parts of their lives, their great pest control. So these are just win-win-win combinations. All right, next slide. So what can we do? We've just started to get a glimpse of who the smiling faces of our beloved insects are <laughs> who we're trying to support. Um, and now let's talk about habitat needs. So I have a picture here from a wonderful um, people's garden in West Philadelphia, the Urban Tree Connection, um, who have wonderful crops and community programming and just added over 500 pollinator plants to help support this vibrancy in their garden. Um, so what does it look like to create this habitat? Next slide. There's three major requirements. And although we often think about planting pollinator plants, which we're absolutely going to get to, we're actually gonna start with shelter and pesticide production. Um, and so shelter is nest sites, overwintering habitat and refuge, right? It's it's great to have all of the pollen, all the plants that provide pollen and nectar and sometimes um, nesting, um, but if they don't have a safe home, there's only so much we can do, right? So let's jump in and talk a little bit about nesting habitat first. Next, sorry. Great, so when we're thinking about these 5,000 species of native bees living um, primarily solitarily in, um, in North America, we're thinking about three major groups. There's the cavity nesting bees, primarily bumblebees, who are creating a social colony during the summer. They are solitary in the sense that only the queen overwinters, so they need a temporary nest site for the, for the growing season. Um, and these are often abandoned rodent burrows, protected areas in rock piles, um, under, under leaves, under um, straw bales, uh, under, in, in walls, like rock walls. Um, we have ground nesting bees. So you can see these little entrance holes. These are actually all solitary individual entrances, but they all happened to like the soil conditions here. So these are like multiple one bedroom apartments pictured in the middle there where one female is in charge of each nest. And then about 30% of our bees are stem or wood nesting. Um, and so these can be a little bit more subtle kind of things we don't always think about when we think about pollinators, but this includes lots of different types of woody habitats and stems. Next. So to protect the 70% of solitary ground nesting bees who use um, soil, um, we want to think about reducing tillage whenever possible. We want to minimize the use of plastic landscape fabric or heavy mulch, um, which can inhibit the ability of pollinators to reach the ground. Um, we want to remind you that although sometimes there are ground nesting social bees who can be aggressive when disturbed, the solitary bees do not have a colony to defend, so they're incredibly gentle. I found out that I, I discovered that I have something of an aggregation of solitary mining bees in my tomato patch surrounded by zinnias this year, and they have not bothered me at all. They're just a joy to watch zipping in and out of their nests, dropping off pollen for their baby bees. Um, next slide. 
So when thinking about wood and nest sites, um, wood is pretty self-explanatory. You can think about ways to use large pieces of wood to line your garden, um, maybe as benches um, in a communal gathering scenario. We'll talk about ways to incorporate these later. And then stems are really awesome because you can increase stem nesting habitat, especially once you're including more perennial native plants very easily, even in the tiniest of gardens. Um, so over 30% of our solitary bees really love this type of habitat. And the simplest way to understand how to create this in your garden is to, after your plants are growing in the fall, leave them up, leave those seed heads up through the winter to provide food for the birds. And then in the springtime, just cut them back, just like in this bottom picture, so that the, the strong dead stalks are standing. And this leaves a little hole at the end. You can see maybe that zoomed in picture with that blue circle shows a little bee butt poking out. This is something you can start to notice in raspberries, in any, um, in lots of different, Stephanie will talk later about species that provide these resources. I um, mean, we can cut them at different heights and the new growth will grow up around Around it, eventually hiding it, and then they'll break down naturally. So this is the only thing you need to do to create this stem nesting habitat. Next slide. And we know that these pieces can all be a little bit overwhelming. This is a lot of different things to keep track of at once. Um, and especially if maybe until today you only knew about the European honeybee, there's this whole kind of maybe overwhelming magical world of different pollinators and beneficials to support. We have lots of different guides, both for experts and for people who are brand new to pollinators to help you learn to see what is already good habitat that you can protect on your property and also to meet some gaps and find the things that you can enhance or add. So we just want to say both while adding these pieces and learning to appreciate them, there's also a lot of tools available for free on our website that you can download and use to think this through slowly in the future. Next slide. Okay, so with that in mind, don't get overwhelmed. Um, in both urban and then we'll show kind of more rural, uh, sorry, other way around, rural and then urban settings or wherever you fall in that continuum, there's lots of ways to tuck these habitat needs into kind of unassuming ways that are that are workable with your current system. So for example, starting to recognize that cover crops, flowering hedgerows, riparian buffers, rock piles, brush piles, and stems, all of these kind of messy edges or borders where you can increase complexity and diversity in niches, or you can think about um, parts of soil or fallow strips or areas you could add cover crop to. These are all places you can tuck in nesting and overwintering habitat, or if you know there's nesting, protect it over the winter so that if there's bees in those stems, they're able to survive the winter as larvae to come out again next spring. All of these different pieces in many cases are things that are about you recognizing and then protecting things that are already exist or learning to maximize the messier edges or the corners or the unused areas of an operation already. Next slide. And in many cases, the same logic is true in urban areas. Um, this is a picture of Sacramento from the aerial view, thinking about how habitat can be connected across a dense urban landscape. And I think about this similarly in the neighborhoods where I work in Philadelphia and across New Jersey and Pennsylvania, is how can we connect the parts of the neighborhood so that all of the different nest types, and soon we'll talk about flowers, can be connected throughout an area. So again, Riparian buffers can provide a lot of these um, woody habitats, so the stems or the brushy corners where bumblebee nap colonies can over can spend the summer. Um, campuses and commercial buildings can do a really great job protecting pollinators from pesticides and putting in uh, blooming um, plantings. There's lots more work with departments of transportation on roadsides and thinking about our, you know the millions of acres that we have on roadsides as pollinator habitat. And of course, plantings in city parks and residential areas. Um, and we'll come next to really thinking about protecting these areas from toxins. Um, but one of the logics when we think about this kind of aerial view and having our any corner of our neighborhood that we have control over contributing to this piece is that bees are flying back and forth all day from nests um, and they may go only 250 meters up to maybe a kilometer from their nest. So we're trying to create a density of resources around a target garden and then really just throughout any urban area in order to create a network of different places where a pollinator can move and gather the resources resources they need in a way that meshes in with our lives. So let's talk about a couple of those options on the next slide here. 
One great place to start thinking about incorporating pollinator habitat is into stormwater infrastructure. Lots of pollinator plants are synergistic with the kinds of things you'd want to plant in rain gardens or bioswales. Many urban areas are along rivers, on lakes, or on the ocean, and are in many ways thinking about storm surge protection, sea level rise, and other climate smart landscaping. Native plants can provide host plants for butterflies, forage plants um, for pollinators while providing this absolutely crucial infrastructure. Um, there's lots of, um, I've heard people call these health strips, these sidewalk strip areas. You can hugely Im improve your beauty, the sense of place, the soil, health, um, and, and um, erosion control while adding forage in these sidewalk strips and other kind of overlooked transit triangles. And then finally, as we were mentioning while talking about woody habitat, we've got benches, we've got garden edges, we have um, kind of artful snags that you can incorporate as decorations into your community gardens. Anything that you can build with untreated wood will increase the insect diversity and add kind of complexity and character to your gardens. And one really amazing thing is that you can do this, yes, thank you, um, that you can do this at a really small scale. So this is a garden um, that I've worked with in South Philadelphia. This is basically the whole thing. You can see it. It's only about 200 plugs. Um, this was part of our Habitat Kit program. And it can be really a wonderful way to bring together the community and this really small space. Um, on the next slide here, you can see in just a few weeks, these plants established and the uh, monarch, the milkweed, this is swamp milkweed, really thriving on this um, dry urban site, totally incredible. And within a couple of weeks, there were monarch butterflies in one of the densest urban neighborhoods I've ever lived in. Um, and so these really small spaces, when you add as many as you can throughout a neighborhood, can really provide meaningful conservation and bring conservation and wildlife and these educational cycles right into the heart of the city and really, really make a difference. All right, next slide. Oops, next slide. There we go, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we've talked a little bit about shelter and now it's time to think about protecting these habitats, right? These may be in vulnerable places, they may be in heavily trafficked areas, they may be in a place where um, there's some sort of integrated pest management program happening. We wanna think about making sure that any plants or nesting habitat we provide is safe. So next slide. Um, with this introduction, hopefully you're a little bit more equipped to think about the multiple ways that a pollinator could be exposed to toxins. Um, as we think about the complexity of their life cycles, we can realize that it's not just on flowers that pollinators can be exposed to pesticides, fungicides, or other toxins, but also via their nest sites, via the leaves or the petals that they may bring back to their nests or via other plant routes that happen with um, the soil was drenched nearby, but if that um, toxin is able to move through the roots and be taken up by a plant or move into a nest site. Um, and so this is just a really important way to think about how crucial it is to minimize our use of any bee toxic um, products, even if we don't think we're spraying it directly on a pollinator. Next. And one really incredible place that you have um, agency and ability to make a big difference with this is when you go to your local nursery or choose where you're buying your plants. Um, Steph will talk in a moment about this first bullet point about um, how we really want to lean towards more native plants when we're developing habitat because those are the ones that the insects have evolved to recognize and use. Um, and in many cases, the highly selected plants have lost um, that are really showy, but maybe less, less like their um, more wild living cousins, um, they may have lost their pollen and nectar. But also Xerxes recently did a study that found that even plants like milkweed, the host plant for monarchs, sold with pollinator labels at some point in their supply chain had had an insecticide used where large numbers of insecticides and fungicides were still found in those plant tissues. And so to minimize insecticide risk, we as a community need to be thinking to work with our nurseries to help them find ways to minimize this risk to pollinators um, at every point of purchasing. And so we have created a guide, next slide, that you can download for free from our website called Buying Bee Safe Plants that helps you have the tools to go to a nursery and evaluate and ask them questions that help you understand whether or not the pollinator plants being sold for sale are really actually safe for pollinators. 
Um, so with that, I think now the next slide, I'm going to hand it back over to Stephanie to talk about plants. Um, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Cass. And yes, yeah, so Cass just helped us uh, walk through these first two elements, shelter and protection. And so next, and now I will discuss uh, this third element of providing food, which comes in the form of pollen, nectar, and host plant material. And I just want to remind uh, everyone that our goal with Habitat is to support pollinators throughout their life cycle. So keep that in mind as we talk about these plants. Uh, next slide, please. So there's many different considerations to make when selecting plants for habitat, such as focusing on native perennial plants, which is going to be the majority of what I'm talking about. Um, as and with these native perennial plants, both focusing on herbaceous and woody species. Uh, we also want to select species that have been locally adapted and match your site's conditions, such as the light and the soil texture and moisture conditions. Um, you also want to provide a succession of blooms that include a diversity of families, flower shapes, and colors, and so on. Um, as Cass mentioned, selecting species that are free of pesticides and with high pollinator value, uh, that are good resources of pollen and nectar, and also nesting sites or nesting material is really good to consider too. Uh, another thing is to also include plants for butterflies and other lepidopterans um, as host plants. Native plants uh, can also benefit you and your community, whether you're selecting plants that have harvestable products like fruits or maybe fibers or other medicinal uses. Um, or if you wanna select species that are easy to divide and propagate, so then you can share those with, um, share those with other folks in your community. Uh, or if you wanna select plants that are culturally significant to you. So there's lots of things to consider depending on your goals. And the last thing I wanted to highlight is uh, availability and cost. So these are also really um, important to consider as you might have found perhaps, uh, it can be hard to find native plants in some areas. And so um, that can influence maybe the plants that are available to you, or maybe if you're opting to purchase seeds for transplants. Uh, next slide, please. So our native perennials, uh, they really can be a great addition to many places, including your urban farms or gardens. Um, and really for some of these spaces, putting in habitat might be good because uh, some of these sites might have soils or other conditions that make it less ideal to grow food crops. And so these native plants could then actually really thrive in maybe these poor soils, or in areas that have less sun, or maybe are like really stay wet, or have um, just, yeah, different, different types of soil that might not be as good to grow your food crops. And so there's all different types of species um, depending on what your site conditions are like. And diverse native plant scenes also support a greater number of pollinator species and beneficial insects. And with that, they provide these necessary pollination and biological control services um, that Cass mentioned. Uh, they also really help with vertebrate wildlife. Uh, think of birds are a good example because uh, birds are also supported by these plantings. For one, they can eat the seeds, uh, but remember insects are also a big part of birds' diets. And so, having these plantings that are attracting a diverse number of insects really do help make a more resilient community for all wildlife and plants. And then additionally, using native plants can also help achieve other conservation goals like reducing water use and help with stormwater management, help reduce heat island effects. And uh, if you're using uh, fertilizer and pesticides, help reduce those too and maybe hopefully switch. Uh, next slide, please. So providing abundant flowers throughout the season is an important uh, element in supporting pollinators throughout their life cycles. 
So different bee species and other pollinators and insects have varying life histories and are active during different times throughout the season. So it's really important to provide diversity of blooms from spring to fall, excuse me, spring to fall, and preferably at least three species uh, per each bloom period. So three species when we're looking at this early season, early summer, late summer, and fall. The plants that we see here um, are an example of common native plants in the Midwest. I have a bias because that's where I'm from and where I'm based now. And so um, here we're highlighting in the early spring, uh, trees and shrubs can really be a good option there as they're often the first to bloom, uh, like we see with this red maple. Milkweeds we see as a early summer example. Those are definitely, um, butterfly milkweeds definitely peak bloom right now in some areas that I see. Um, mountain mints later in the summer are another good option. And uh, in the fall, uh, sneeze we, we see here can also be a really good option. All right, next slide, please. And so when you're selecting native plants, we wanna remember again, choose, well, diversity is important. So we wanna choose a diversity of plant families because this diverse, this diversity of plants means more diverse pollinators for your diverse cropping systems. So it's all connected and it's all um, really important aspect to focus on. And so asters, this is the first plant family that we've highlighted here and maybe one that you're pretty common with. They are wonderful and such a diverse family. And you can actually often find um, species that bloom from spring to fall within this family. Uh, but I also think that sometimes we, we might rely on asters a little too much. And so it's good to diversify. And so we have a small selection of a few other great families here like legumes, um, like we see with this lead plant, those can be good nitrogen fixers. Um, willows, another good early season blooming woody plant. And then also these native uh, loose stripes that we see here. Um, but again, there's many other families to choose from. Um, and this is where we can also diversify flower shapes, colors, height, textures. Uh, yes, next slide, please. All right, so I mentioned earlier that we also want to include butterfly host plants. So many caterpillars are very specialized in the plants that they eat, like the monarch that we see here uh, eating this milkweed. Milkweed is also a great example of host plants for monarchs, but also remember when we're providing habitat for monarchs, other butterflies uh, also consider their life cycle. So adults need other nectarine resources. Um, so this bottom right photo, we see asters with that adult monarch on, that's an excellent late summer, early fall choice um, for, for these monarchs. And many of these host plants and other nectar plants are also very attractive to other beneficial insects and predators and parasitoids. So when you're adding plants for one, maybe target family like butterfly, you're gonna make a butterfly garden. It's really helping benefit a whole um, number of other wildlife. Next slide. And next, I want to talk about native bunch grasses and sedges, like we see here um, uh, along the left edge of uh, this lettuce in the field. So these provide these native bunch grasses and sedges provide multiple resources. Uh, this includes host plants for butterflies, and uh, can also be nesting and overwintering sites for pollinators and other wildlife. Uh, think about like bumblebee queens that are needing to over winter, so just that single bumblebee queen for next year's uh, next year's colony. She's trying to find somewhere to hunker down, and these bunch grasses are a great place for that. Also for predaceous beetles, that can also be really good uh, predators of some of our um, un unwanted crop insects and things. <laughs> um, but these grasses can also help with different environmental benefits to like erosion control or help better uh, support water infiltration and sequester carbon. And then I also just wanna point out that these native bunch grasses and sedges 
work well in um, native wildflower plantings as the grasses can help kind of break up some of the, the different drifts of flowers that you plant. So if you're using plugs and putting in more of like an intentional um, kind of landscapes look, uh, these grasses can really kind of help break that up and it's fun for the eye to look at the different textures. And next slide. So earlier Cass mentioned that about 30% of our native bees nest in stems and wood. And so here are some of those uh, perennial flowers that can double also as nesting habitat. Um, so I have a few listed here and then also examples um, of those cut. Uh, but but we, we do wanna focus on plants with pithy or hollow stems uh, when we're thinking about stem nesters. And so this includes plants like caneberries, like raspberries, uh, but also elderberries, uh, sumacs, joe pieweed, coneflower, hyssop, sunflowers, and roses are just a few really common examples that people can find uh, no matter where they are in the US. Uh, not shown here though um, are the wood. And so I just wanted to come back to this because I think it's a really important topic, uh, but wood borders using uh, wood borders around your habitat plantings using uh, logs, stumps, or branches are also really great nesting resources. Uh, but additionally, these wood borders can also help add cues to care so uh, and add a learning opportunity. And maybe in addition with like a uh, pollinator habitat sign or other educational signs can really help inform the community what this planting is here for, the purpose, and hopefully keep everyone happy and excited about pollinators like we are. Next slide. All right, so as we're getting closer to the end of the talk, we wanted to highlight some plants that we can use and eat too. And so these next couple of slides show predominantly non-native annuals. Um, but these could also be good options to support pollinators and other beneficial insects. And they might honestly be plants that you're already growing, whether it's for intentionally for the pollinators or maybe as herbs or just for beauty because they can make uh, wonderful cut flowers or just standing, <laughs> make, your, make the space beautiful. Um, so sunflowers, this is what we see photoed here. And this is a great pollinator plant. Um, this photo is highlighting, each of these circles is highlighting um, different bees or other pollinators that are visiting uh, these sunflowers. You can see just how popular that they are. Uh, other herbs we wanted to highlight as well are bachelor buttons, coreopsis, uh, blanket flower, cosmos, zinnia, sweet alyssum, and calendula. All right, next slide. And then here's a few more non-native annuals that could be good for beneficial insects um, that again, you might already be growing. Um, in this photo on the left, we see this predatory uh, myriad bug. And next to that, we see a leaf cutter bee. Both of these are on, on a basil plant. Um, and with this, I just wanted to point out that remember for pollinator benefit with these herbs, it is really important that we let at least some of these plants go to flower so that they can access those pollen and nectar resources. Um, so that's what we see in that right photo. But uh, some of these other non-native herbs that can be really beneficial are dill, fennel, cilantro, borage, uh, and coriander, just to name a few of, few of those annuals. Okay, next slide. All right, so we've talked briefly about some of the non-native annual edibles, but there's also many native pollinator attractive plants that are edible too, or maybe have other uses as well. And so, I don't know, you might first just instinctively think of some of our common food crops, maybe some of our native fruit tree varieties or blueberries, strawberries, and squash, but many of our native plants commonly used in, hab in pollinator habitat plantings can also be used um, to make tea or used otherwise as culinary herbs as well, like these uh, herbaceous plants, shrubs, and trees we see pictured on the left. 
And so these include um, some of the most common families you all might be familiar with, uh, like mint, aster, nettle, which I'm actually gonna highlight next. Uh, also rose, sumac, cypress, and pine. And um, of course there's more, there's, there's many other uh, native plants that could be used for culinary or other medicinal or other purposes, but this plant, List was created by Xerces staff member based in Minnesota, so it does have a little bit of a, a Midwest bias, but there are also many plants shown here that have a wide native range spreading across the U.S. And next slide. So in the theme of the People's Garden webinar series, we wanted to share a recipe with you all. Uh, so the plant that we chose and that we wanted to highlight in our recipe is a uh, common singing nettle or Urtica dioica. And since it's pollinator week, we of course also wanted to highlight uh, a native plant that pollinators use and is fairly recognizable to folks across the country. And so first, the pollinator benefit singing nettle is the larval or caterpillar host plant for a couple of butterflies. So the red admiral and the question mark butterflies uh, to highlight the some of the nutrition. Uh, nettles are actually a really uh, nutrient dense food and are a good source of vitamins, minerals, calcium, iron, protein, antioxidant, can help with other, um, uh, other ailments too, like help reduce inflammation, allergies, uh, help Im improve respiratory health and more. And then I just wanted to mention uh, a few things on, on harvesting, whether it's where we might find it or I don't know, my some of my first interactions. So I don't know if you're like me, <laughs> um, many of you might be familiar with this plant because maybe you've been stung by it, by those stinging hairs that we can see in the bottom photo. Um, or maybe it's on your property and it's an undesirable plant, undesirable weed, um, because it can easily spread via their uh, root rhizomes and kind of, if it's in, a, in an ideal spot, it can really kind of take over. Um, but this plant is often found in the understory of woody or wet, low-lying, kind of disturbed areas with really rich soils, often brought on by flooding. And so, again, you might have this plant on your property and are looking for ways to manage it. So cooking with it um, or making tea with it might be a good option for you. But do just remember um, to harvest responsibly and to ensure uh, your plant ID. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and then I just wanted to briefly show you all, because I mentioned that um, seeing that old host plant for a couple of these Nymphalidae butterflies. So the red admiral, we see the adult on a plum tree on the left, also the caterpillar on the nettle leaf. And then on the right, we see the question mark on a common milkweed flower and the larva again on the nettle. All right, next slide. And then for our recipe, because again, we want to share a recipe with you all, we're sharing a stinging nettle spanakopita. And so we really wanted a recipe that highlights the nettles and really makes them the star in this kind of herby, cheesy, buttery nettle pastry pie. <laughs> and so you can see the instructions and the ingredients listed here. Um, I won't have time to go through this with you all, but you can take a screenshot or revisit this video later. Um, this recipe was recommended by that same uh, Xerces staff in Minnesota that helped with that um, native uh, tea list. Um, she's also an avid forager, but um, this recipe was adopted by BBC's Country File magazine. And next slide. All right, so we wanted to bring things kind of full circle and reflect on this. Um, kind of flowchart slide again as to why we add pollinator habitat. So by adding pollinator habitat, we are creating more resilient plant and wildlife communities, which then helps and aids in growing and distributing food for a greater benefit of people and communities. And so with this last minute or so, I just want to 
make a connection with helping communities and, and provide you all with a, with a few resources. Next slide. So I mentioned at the beginning that Cass and I um, and many other Thursday staff are also NRCS partner biologists. So in this partnership, we work with NRCS and producers and doing so we provide technical assistance and support, whether that's helping you to integrate pollinator beneficial insect habitat on your site, provide education or outreach or help with other related management goals you might have. So if you are interested in learning more about NRCS and their programs, feel free to reach out to your local NRCS office directly, um, or you could reach out to Cast and I, or if there's a Thursday staff member um, in a state near you, feel free to reach out to one of us too. Next slide. And of course, I wanted to share some of Xerces' wonderful uh, resources on our website. We have lots of free, uh, really nice PDFs um, that is available for you to print out on various topics. Going from regionally specific plants, we have brand new plant lists that we're really excited about. Uh, different information on pollinators, other beneficial insects for soil invertebrates, habitat restoration, and community science work. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention, uh, or that we didn't mention in this talk about habitat and pollinators, is the site prep involved in some of this work. And so site prep is a really important step in creating pollinator habitat and definitely not one to be rushed when you can avoid it. Um, and so I just want to give a shout out to our uh, organic site prep guide if you are interested in that. And next slide. And that is our presentation today. So we wanted to say thank you. Thank you to John and Nina and folks at the People's Garden Initiative and to our wonderful ASL interpreters. And um, if you all have any questions, want to follow up with Cass or I, our emails are um, on this slide here. So yes, thank you again. Thank you, Cass and Stephanie, for very interesting presentations. Boy, that recipe sounded really yummy. <laughs> I'd also like to thank all of you for attending the People's Garden webinar on the pollinators. Don't forget to register for the People's Garden. We currently have 1,400 res registered gardens. Why not make yours one of them? Questions and feedback on the webinar series can be directed to our email address at O-U-A-I-P at USDA.gov. Thank you so much for attending and we'll catch you around. Take care. <laughs>